Can we have another round of applause for that incredible film? And I want to welcome back up to the stage the director of the film, Bill Nicoletti, as well as the rest of the team who are going to join us for a little panel discussion. Well, Bill, I guess to start off, I'm curious to know, I know this film has been gestating for many years, um, but what has that sort of journey been like? What's your connection to Sigma Sound, and at what point did you decide that this would be a great subject for a documentary? So my connection to Sigma Sound is that I was a tenant at Sigma Sound. I rented space there. I had an editing suite. Um, that was a novelty for Joe to have video in the house. So he used to hang out in my uh, editing suite a lot, ask a lot of questions. And in return, I would do the same at night. I would sit in on, ed on um, audio mixes at Sigma. So Joe and I became friends quickly, and we learned a lot from each other and, and, and was intrigued with it and, and thought someday um, with the stories he shared with me, uh, it would be worthy to, to tell a film. Cool. And so at what point, how long ago was this that you actually decided that you were going to make this film? Because I know it's been a so, while. So the idea for the film came in 1992. Um, the, a little while ago. <laughs> the, the actual first meeting took place in March of 2014. Um, and then we didn't pick up a camera until January of 2015. And can you guys talk a little bit about, you know, how you came onto the project and what that's been like for you as well? Whoever um, wants to start. Yeah, sh sure. Um, about six years almost to the date, um, I sat in on a couple of the interviews with Jazzy Jeff, Christian McBride. Um, I've known Bill since we were kids. Um, and then that, that's where I began to learn a bit of, about the music, I was like, wow, I grew up with a lot of this music, listening to it through the 60s and 70s. Um, and I was like, how can I be a part of, you know, making sure that the story is told of this iconic studio that, you know, so much music came through and so many people collaborated on. And that's sort of how I got into it. Um, and it's been a journey. He was on the journey well before I started, but uh, it's been an interesting journey since then. Sure. And I imagine the editing journey is a huge part of the process, too, because there's so much information, so much material. But what was editing this film together like? Yeah, and I'm going to hop in because this would be a good time for Mark to jump in because we wouldn't have gotten to the editing stage unless Mark um, came on as an executive producer. Yeah, thank you, Bill. So I met Bill back uh, probably 2015. Uh, I was CEO of WSFS Bank at the time, and Bill was a small customer, but was coming in to pitch an idea about a, uh, a documentary, a film about Marian Anderson, and um, which, which ultimately went on to win uh, a lot of awards, um, and is an amazing film. But as a Philadelphia myself, I grew up in the Logan section of, of Philadelphia. I was intrigued and, and obviously also um, had some fondness for the, for the topic. Uh, and uh, we invested as a company a little bit in that film, went on to do great things, and then Bill and I struck up a connection and uh, he came to me, you know, probably 2017 or so and said, I'm working on this thing called The Sound of Philadelphia. And I said, that's the music that my older brothers and sisters grew up on it because they grew up on it. As a younger brother, I grew up on it and, uh, and uh, really loved the idea and got involved with Bill probably seven or eight years ago as an executive producer. A um, little bit of money, a uh, little bit of uh, help with contracts and calls and connections and a uh, little bit of creative here and there that um, if he managed to take my advice on it, which he didn't need. So. A lot of it, the whole Linda Creed section actually um, was was a, a very long conversation that Mark had, and, and he saw an early cut of the film, and he encouraged me, I don't know if you remember that or not, to, to build out the Linda Creed story more, um, which was, you know, a, a beautiful moment in my life because I got to know Linda Creed's family. Hallie Creed, who's here, who's one of our most loyal mm -hmm. um, friends. Um, <laughs> her two daughters. And, you know, we, we have hopes of someday doing a, a Linda Creed story, which is something I would, nothing more I would love to do. Dexter Gresh, are you here? Get up here, my man. What the heck? 
Can we get another chair by any chance for Dexter? Um, if so, not, I can vacate yeah. my seat. <laughs> <laughs> so you could, you could start the editing question and, and give Dexter time to think about it while he makes his way up here. He's quick on his feet. What was the question? The, the moderator. Just to talk about sort of, um, thank you. Uh, how you went about shaping such an immense story that touched so many lives, had so many different stories sort of within it into this like very tight package of this, you know, less than 90 minute movie. Uh, well, yeah, fortunately we had 10 years to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it took all those 10 years pretty much. I mean, we, you know, we started out you know, Bill had shot some interviews and we had some pictures that people donated and stuff. And one of the big problems was that, I guess, for whatever reason, nobody ever filmed anything in Sigma Sound at the time. It was like a policy. They didn't want cameras there. That was all about the music and blah, blah, blah. So there's very little actual, you know, if you see most music documentaries, there's a lot of old footage of, of uh, musicians in the studio. We didn't have any of that, so... We had to collect all the pictures, and we had to come up with creative ways to uh, to visualize things. And um, it also it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a straight linear story. It was uh, you know sort of a bunch of stories that could have been presented in any order. And so it was kind of a challenge to have all that make sense. Well, I think you pulled it off beautifully, and yes. I think everyone here probably <laughs> agrees. Um, and I should say, too, also, this is a Q&A, so I'm going to open it up to the audience. I know everyone probably has some questions. Um, I think I see one in the very back. Is someone raising their hand? Yeah. Feel free to just shout it out. You don't have to <laughs> approach. Okay. So, I didn't know it would get opened up this way, but I'm going to take this as a business question, <laughs> not as a creative question. Um, so, the answer is yes, to answer your question, of course. I mentioned Linda Creed um, a few moments ago, but, you know, this film basically turns into a pumpkin in about an hour and a half. Um, you know, we've been working on this film for a long time, and we carried it a long way. Um, you know, you have Sean and Mark up here, up on stage, and... Um, you know, they came on as producers early on in the project when investing was a gigantic risk. It was a, a relationship and a concept that they trusted. Um, since then, you know, here we are tonight with a finished film. Um, we have the music um, procured, not paid for, that's half a million dollars, and we have the archives procured, but not paid for, 250,000, and we have commitments from three gigantic the theatrical distributors for our film, $250,000. So a million dollars is what we need to get this film into the theaters, this is, which is where we want it, make some money, and then make our next documentary. And I thought you guys did an excellent job, even though we didn't have like, the video footage or like, stuff, but I thought one of my favorite shots of the film was in the very beginning where you had Chubby Checker like, Yeah, that was we. You know, we found that early on, and um, Chris Majardis. I don't know if he's still here. Chris but is he, here. Chris, you want to stand up? He, he had a big hand. He came in toward the end and gave it a lot of those beautiful, funky, crazy graphics that really lifted the level of the thing. So, so yep. And, and to Dexter's point earlier, we didn't we didn't have a lot of footage from the studio. We did have a lot of photos, uh, but what Chris and his team did for us. Um, very late down the stretch was we we made a creative decision as a team everything was very collaborative as Dexter said um, That we're gonna make Philadelphia a character in our film um, Since we don't have what's in the studio Let's show and, and feature and showcase our beautiful city um, Show the neighborhoods where everyone came from 
um, do some really nice graphic treatments where we show where people came from and um, that that really kind of helped work to kind of move you along so hopefully you weren't missing things yeah so I'm going to amplify what Bill said earlier which is the way to get more stories made about Philadelphia is to see this film out in wide distribution and see it be a success so it it is, it is all here. This is a great, great film. I, I've seen many iterations from its start, and every iteration got better. Um, and uh, if we can make this one a success, Bill is working on a story about Linda Creed right now. And uh, I, to me, that was the warmest part. Of, I mean, there was many, many warm parts about this, but that was the warmest part of the whole story. So there's a lot in Philadelphia music to be told, and this is the guy that can do it. And, and I want to make sure that I thank Bob Demento, who was here. He was, he was one of our early producers. I can't see. I have lights in my face. But Bob is um, a very dear friend of mine who, like my other friends up here, believed in this project early on. Um, you know, I, I can't emphasize, you know, when, when you're an independent film and an independent filmmaker, uh, how much a community, um, word of mouth, guys, please, you know, tell everyone if you like the film. Please let them know. If you know someone at Hulu or Netflix, let me know. Um, but you know, the, it really does take word of mouth. And, and being here tonight, this was honestly two months ago. I had no idea where we were going with this film. And then I get a call from Andrew Greenblatt. I'm sitting. Uh, I'm always eating when I get good news. Uh, but I'm sitting at a, at a diner with my wife and, and her mom. And Andrew, I get the message that we're in the Philadelphia International Film Festival. I almost fell off my chair. Um, and, I, and I knew we had, you know, we had another breath of life. And, and I never thought we'd be sitting here on a Friday night doing this. So uh, thank you guys. I'm, I'm not closing the questions. I'm just. But um, to, your, to your point that you made is there's a lot of stories to be told about Philly music. Mm -hmm. Like having just sat in on some of the uh, interviews, you know, Jazzy Jeff, Christian McBride, they talk about how the generational influence flowed through this city. So it wasn't just, you know, the 60s, right? It was the 70s, 80s, 90s. Like, it just flowed through and, and uh, played forward. And so there's just a lot of stories that can be told about this city and the great music that has occurred here and flowed through here. And, and, and really, the beautiful thing that we hope to get out there is this is it. I mean, this is the only film on Philadelphia music of its kind that will ever have Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, Joe Tarsia, and Tommy, Tommy Bell. Bell. Yeah. Um, they're the four pillars. You know, that's it. And, you know, there's so many films on Motown, and, and don't get me wrong, they're good. Elvis Presley, um, Taylor Swift, The Beatles. Um, I think what we were learning as we were making this film... Um, and I'm Italian, so I might get sappy, but there was so much love that was flowing um, from the people that we were interviewing and, and the admiration they had for each other um, and the admiration Dexter and I had, you know, when we were sitting in the edit suites, um, you know, putting this together. And I think a lot of documentaries are very from the head. We kind of always felt this one was from the heart, um, which we're hoping is something that people recognize. Thank you. I think I saw a hand right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this funny little thing happened called COVID that got in the way. Billy Joel was on our, was our? Billy Paul. Oh, Billy Paul. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, uh, I, I apologize for that. So Billy Paul um, was someone who we interviewed and um, based upon, he was much older when we shot him and we just had to make some editorial decisions. Um, but he, he was in there in the film, but we just, we felt with the flow of what we were doing, it just wasn't coming together. We had made a lot. We made a lot of tough decisions like that throughout the making of the film. 
Yeah, we did. Uh, after that reunion that you saw in the film at the at the plaque dedication, there was a reception at the uh, at the visitor center in Independence Mall. And one of my life highlights is seeing the whole Sigma House band and Billy Paul do me and Mrs. Jones in person. It was just. It was just incredible. I've seen a bunch of hands. I'm going to go with um, the back of this front section. I saw a hand go up. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there there was, and I'm embarrassed to admit that's one of my best friends out there. So uh, I didn't I didn't ask him to ask this question. Um, so the two the two big ironies I, that are in the film I don't know if if anyone picked up on them or not, um, but it was it was the relationship between American Bandstand heading to the West Coast and the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan, like on the same weekend. Like crazy, and 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 those two events really decimated Philadelphia music for a period in time. But I had no idea that they happened, um, you know, right at the same time. And 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 the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Vision show. Um, and the thing that was another irony, and Joe mentions it in the film, when he opened his New York um, studio, it was at the Ed Sullivan Theater. So I, I feel like there's like these little things in there that are subtle, but really we're, we're learning um, uh, elements. Dexter? Well, I, I learned a lot working on the film. I, I had, you know, I, I was a teenager in the 70s and uh, in my 20, early 20s, and uh, I kind of knew Sigma was there, but I didn't really know... Um, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it at the time, but uh, uh, and throughout the whole process, it was, it was like, oh, that song was recorded there, that song was recorded there, oh my God. You know, it was just a real uh, education for me, and, and it's just incredible how all those songs have stood the test of time. And, and, and really, this is more on a personal level with Joe, um, the amount of guilt that he had um, for making his studio his life. Um, you know, he also he always would talk to me about. You know, I have. You know, I wish I was there for my family. And one day we were working together on something. And and Joe, I don't know if you picked up on it. it was very sharp tongue, witty, um, but also very nostalgic. And we're work, working together. And he goes, Billy, you know, you're you're. I think you're a talented kid, and I think you'll do some things. He said, but you're only going to be so so successful because you love your family too much. <laughs> Um, and, and when he said that, you know, I, I, I knew it was a compliment, even though it didn't sound like it. Um, but I, I knew exactly, I knew exactly what he meant. Um, and it was, it was really important for Joe before he passed that he did resurrect all his relationships with his family. Um, so that was a learning process for me because we became so close through, um, through the last 10 years of his life. I think we probably have time for just one or two more questions, so I'll go right straight back. Uh, 68 to 03, I think. Um, I think that's about right. Any Sigma guys in the... In, that's correct. Yeah. And, and prior to 03, I mean, I could, I could speak to this. I mean, really, from the mid-90s, I mean, Jim, maybe you can tell me, but, you know, Sigma really, its heyday was 68 to, you know, the late 70s, early, early 80s. Um, and then they just kind of rode, rode the wave for a while, but the music industry changed dramatically. Yes, sir. We got, well, the, we got, uh, you know, high quality recordings from the record companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't, know, I don't know, but did we ever use any stuff from the from Drexel? We did. Yeah. Yeah, there was some they stuff. Were, they were digital. I mean, they weren't on tape, like 24 track, but they were digitally transferred, um, big files. Yeah. The um, 
when, when Sigma closed, there was a whole archive of master tapes there that were unclaimed, and um, they're all in a, in a vault somewhere at Drexel University, and they use it, I guess, the, the students there um, study them or, you know, make use of them, however. But uh, um, so we, we did use some of those tapes. Right, one more question. Go right there. Jim, do you want to help me with that? <laughs> who uh, was who? recording in the 80s and 90s? Uh, Robert Palmer. Yeah. yeah. Phyllis Hyman, Patty. Yeah, Grover, right? Yeah, they were with David Ivory um, with Rough House, but he was in Sigma. Yep. How many Sigma people in the audience? Can you guys stand up? Well, thank you guys all so much for coming here, and thank you all for sharing the film. And I guess just before we go, if anyone's you know not a Netflix or Hulu executive in the audience, but how can folks send, kind of get the word out and support the film and find out more about the film? Is there any way to kind of yeah give this keep pushing? Mark, you want to help me? You're you're good at closing the deal. So if you if you are an investor or if you know an investor that would like to see this wonderful wonderful film be widely distribute, distributed and have everybody else have the same reaction to it you did and learn more about what, great, what a great town Philly is and what great music came from Philadelphia, please, please contact Bill Nicoletti. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. <laughs>